Good morning, everyone. I call to order the third quarter meeting of the State Fire Prevention and Building Code Council here in Albany, New York, <coughs> Buffalo, and several remote locations. It is September 29th, 2023, at just after 10 o'clock. My name is Matt Tivo. I'm the Secretary's designee and chair of the Code Council. To my left is Kevin Dor Clark, who is the Secretary to the Council. To my right, Ayota Hyde, who is the Council to the Council. And to her right is David Gonzalez, General Counsel of the Department of State. Good morning. Okay. We have a decent agenda today. It will take us a little time to get through it. I'm just going to run through it real fast with the members so everybody knows what's coming. We will start by adopting the draft minutes of June 23rd, 2023. We will then take up the notice of adoption on the, uh, on the secret reg that we saw back in June. John will give a division update. After that, we will hear from both Kevin and uh, from Chris Corcoran from NYSERDA to walk us through where we are with our code development, our timeline, what's happening. Following that, we will have public comment. I think something like 16 signed up right now after that we'll just run through the meetings for the for the next year and change and then we'll finish uh, with any other business and adjourn for the day uh, we will take because I have a feeling this is going to take a little bit we will take a little time maybe 20 30 minutes for a quick lunch bathroom whatever break that stretch your legs break somewhere in there we'll, we'll play that by ear and figure out where to fit it Okay, Kevin, if you will be so kind as to establish a quorum for us. Matt Tebow. I'm here. Ben Keller. Here. Michael Weber. Here. Vincent Rapachulo. Here. Joseph DiStefano. Here. Claudia Bramer. Here. Joseph Toomey. Here. Sean Hamlin. Here. Timothy DeRusher. Here. Robert Hughes. Here. William Tyne. Here. Dominic Marinelli. Here. Keith Wen. Patrick Dolan. Here. And Michael Sabatino. Okay, so Michael emailed. He is, uh, he is uh, experienced some travel with delays given the weather downstate so we'll we'll announce him once he once he arrives and leave in New York City. Okay so then pursuant to public officers law section 103A quorum is established at 12 members attending in locations open to the public <coughs> two members participating via video conference from a remote location that is not open to the public. Um, if members not attending the Albany location if you guys could everybody make sure your microphones are muted if you wish to speak, uh, unmute and state your full name so we can get it for the record. And as Matt mentioned, at this time we have about 16 to 18 <coughs> participants uh, looking to give public comment today. We'll limit the amount of time for each public comment to three minutes. And anyone from the public wishing to address the co-council during the public comment period who has not previously indicated, please chat in to Chad Sievers, who's the co-host for the meeting, and uh, he'll collect some information from you and then we can get you on the list of people wishing to speak. Okay, Kevin, are there any agenda changes for today from what I noted? No? No. Okay. Then that moves us to agenda item number two, which is the draft minutes of June 23rd, 2023. Uh, are there any changes? You should have received any packets or my email. Are there any changes? Okay, noting none. Uh, I will take a motion to approve the draft minutes of June 23rd, 2023. Joe Toomey makes the motion. May I have a second? Second. Okay. We have a second. We have several seconds. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Hearing none, the draft minutes of June 23rd, 2023 are approved. Moves us to agenda by item number three. That is the notice of adoption for part 1263, implementation of state. Environmental Quality Review Act, which is a regulation that you all saw back in June, and we put it out for public comment, received, I believe, one, and we are now moving it for adoption. Can we go 
to do a sure. talk to you, right? Yes. So um, just as a reminder, as Matt pointed out, we, we had already seen this back in June. Um, the notice of proposed rulemaking was published in the State Register on July 5th. No individuals attended the public hearing on September 6th. We did receive one comment letter, and we made some non-substantive changes to the rule in response to the comment received to complement DEC's regulations found in 6 NYCRR section 617.5. So you received a copy of that through this package, um, the notice of adoption package today, and we're looking for a notice of adoption. Oh. Okay. So, is there any discussion before we move to the two votes, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, is there any discussion on the, on the notice of adoption you should receive it ahead of time? Seeing none. Okay, Peniota, if you will read the first motion, which is the seeker motion, not the seeker regulation, please. For your consideration. I move one, that the co-council find and determine that the adoption of the rule identified in agenda item three, notice of adoption part 1263, implementation of state environmental quality review act, will not have a significant environmental effect and will not have a significant adverse effect on any significant fish or wildlife habitat, scenic resource or statewide significance, important agricultural land or area included in an approved local waterfront revitalization program. And two, that come into Clark PE be authorized to sign and deliver on behalf of the co council and the Department of State A, the State Environmental Quality Review Act short environmental assessment form indicating that no or small impact may occur in response to each question in part two of the form and determining in part three of the form that the proposed action will not result in any significant adverse environmental impacts. B, the New York State Department of State Coastal Management Program Coastal Assessment Form and C, the certification of no significant coastal impact. So moved. Okay, I will make that motion. Can I have a second for that motion, please? Show two of me seconds the motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. Kevin, if you'll so call the roll for me, please. Matt Tebow. Yeah, I. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> ben Keller. Yes. Michael Weber. Yes. Vincent Rapachulo. Yes. Joseph DiStefano? Yes. Claudia Bramer? Yes. Joseph Toomey? Yes. Sean Hamlin? Yes. Timothy DeRusher? Yes. Robert Hughes? Yes. William Tyne? Yes. Dominic Marinelli? Yes. Patrick Dolan? Yes. Keith Wen? Keith Wen? The latter? Yes. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, that is adopted unanimously. Can you order the second motion, please? For your consideration. Can you speak up a little, please? Yeah. I move one, that the rule identified in agenda item three, notice of adoption, part 1263, implementation of state environmental quality review act, be adopted as a permanent rule. Two, that the Department of State is directed to file a notice of adoption with respect to the rule. And three, that the rule shall be effective on the date the notice of adoption is published in the State Register. So moved. Okay, I'll make that motion. Can I have a second, please? Ben Keller seconds, because I look to my right instead of my left. Thank you, Ben. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? Okay. Hearing none, Kevin, you'll be so kind. Matt Tebow. Yes. Ben Keller. Yes. Michael Weber. Yes. Vincent Rapachulo. Yes. Joseph DiStefano. Yes. Claudia Bramer. Yes. Joseph Toomey. Yes. Sean Hamlin. Yes. Timothy DeRusher. Yes. Robert Hughes. Yes. William Tyne. Yes. Dominic Marinelli. Yes. Patrick Dolan. Yes. Keith Wen? Yes. Motion carries and the rule is adopted. Thank you all. All right, so that's us up for next year. <laughs> okay, we're on to agenda item number four, the division update. 
Uh, though the division is very, very busy at this point on code development, there are a few other things going on that we wanted John to walk through with the council. So John, if you'd be so kind. Uh, thank you, Chair Tebow. Uh, good morning, co-council members. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Okay, good. All right. So um, the first item, I just want to mention, uh, and I've, I've discussed this at previous meetings, the code division staff continues to work with other agencies and work groups on matters that involve potential code related issues. So currently there are several different work groups that our uh, staff is working on and will continue to do so. So one of the work groups that, that does have some final proposed code related matters is the uh, lithium ion battery work group. Um, we did indicate to the work group that the code council will be considering the 2024 fire code for the next uh, update to the uniform code. So the, the 2024 does include new language that addresses the, the use of the powered micro mobility devices um, like your e-scooters. So I just want to point out briefly some of those those changes at a, at a high level. Um, the update would be prohibit the use of res residential occupancies as a business for charging of commercially owned powered mobility devices. Uh, also, it calls out for powered mo uh, mobility devices to be charged in accordance with manufacturer's instructions uh, using only the manufacturer's supply charging equipment. Plus, uh, the devices will have to be listed and labeled in accordance with uh, relevant UL, UL standards, and then also the update includes a series of requirements for when um, charging locations for commercially owned mobility devices uh, have to meet certain requirements, including a fire safety plan. So uh, these changes are all in the package that, that you were given at the last meeting. And again, we did indicate that the, the co-council will be considering considering these for the next proposed uh, changes in the next update. So I just wanted to keep you informed on that. Um, so as the work of the other groups finalize, I will keep you updated, the co-council updated on that. The last thing I just want to update on is the uh, ICC code development process. So the ICC hearings for the next update, which includes the updates to the 2024 code to create the 2027 code, the hearings are scheduled for um, the beginning of April of 2024. So that's the group A, they break it down into two groups, group A and group B. Um, the group A is IBC, IFC, uh, IMC, IPC, and, and some of those, the, the rest of them will be, be in group B. So those hearings, again, like I said, is, is uh, starting in April. And we actually had some appointments to some of those committees and that uh, I just want to point those out because our staff, um, I know they, they've done a lot of work on, on the committees in the past and, and now they've been, um, we've had some appointments. So Emma uh, Gonzalez Ladders and China Clark were appointed to the Residential Code Interpretation Committee. Uh, Jeannie Rice will serve on the IBC Structural Committee. Uh, Kevin Dewar Clark has been appointed as an alternate to the IEB. IEBC committee. Uh, Chris Jensen has been appointed to the Energy Code Interpretation Committee, and Brian Tollison um, sits on the uh, ICC 1100, which is the spray foam committee. So another thing I'll just point out is New York City has quite a few appointments on the on the committees as well. So which is which is great and. So New York State is going to have a, 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 a as a whole has a big presence on on the com committees in the upcoming cycle, which which is which is really good. Um, and again, as we've done in the past, uh, anticipating that we're going to have uh, a few code change proposals for the 2024 code, code as we as we move forward. So um, that's all I have, unless there's there's questions. Are there any questions for John? Okay, jump to Kevin here. Kevin on, on MRLSs, please. Yep, so we do have one MRLS for the uniform code that we did receive from the town of Goshen for flood provisions. Um, it's under review and we've scheduled a meeting with the town to meet with them next week to review some of our comments and questions that we have. And then once we do that, we'll, we'll continue on our review and prepare a staff analysis for the code council 
to review. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Are there any questions on that? Hearing none, we'll move to agenda item five, which is Uniform Code and Energy Code, Code Development Update. So we're going to start with uh, you, right, Kevin? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Okay, you go first. <laughs> I'll, we'll get Chris in here, too. So at the June 2023 meeting, division staff provided draft version 2.0 code development documents for the Uniform Code. Those documents contain changes made through the 24 and 21 International Co-Council development cycles combined into separate documents for the property maintenance code, fire code, plumbing code, mechanical code, dual gas code, existing building code, and residential code. The building code document was not complete for the June 2023 meeting and contained about 50% of the ICC code change proposals. Version 2.1 of the draft code, <laughs> draft building code development document was provided prior to today's meeting and posted on the division's website. It includes all of the 24 and 21 international code council development code changes. Now all version two draft documents of the uniform code are posted on the website and are in the same phase of develop development for this code update. As it pertains to the energy code, version 1.0 of the draft development documents presented at the March 2023 meeting included some changes necessitated by the Advanced Building Codes Act of 2022. The document includes things such as treatment of historic buildings, consolidation of exceptions, and consideration of clean energy and greenhouse gas emission reductions and the scope and intense limits. The draft version 2.0 energy code documents contain some of the goals set in the scoping plan for the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, CLCPA, such as provisions for the 21 International Energy Code and provisions for New York Stretch that modify the Energy Conservation Construction Code of New York State and those that were anticipated to not change further in the development of the 24 IECC. Additionally, it had proposed changes received from the public since publication of the 2020 ECC NYS. ECCC NYS. Part RR of Chapter 56 of the Laws of 2023 requires NYSERDA to develop and submit for the co councils consideration provisions that achieve energy savings greater than the most recently published International Energy Conservation Code and ASHRAE 90.1. To that end, NYSERDA is developing a set of advanced energy efficiency proposals and division staff is working closely with NYSERDA to review those proposals and integrate them into a future version of the draft code development documents. It's anticipated that further versions of the energy code documents prepared for consideration by the co-council will include provisions of New York Stretch 2020 that modify ASHRAE 90.1, NYSERDA's advanced energy efi efficiency proposals, other New York State specific changes based on necessary statutory requirements, including the balance of the changes from the 24 IECC development cycle and any remaining CLCPA recommendations. Since the June meeting, division staff has been working on advancing the development of the next version of the draft documents by reviewing and incorporating New York State specific modifications, including draft language for the implementation of the prohibition on fossil fuels, including the required definitions, exemptions, and effective dates, Required amendments to the Uniform Code based on NYSERDA's advanced energy efficiency proposals. Required amendments based on other legislation such as grease straps, hot tub barrier requirements, as well as other New York State specific provisions such as rail stations. Coordination between the Energy Code and Uniform Code for the implementation of the required amendments based on the Advanced Building Codes Act of 2022, CLCPA recommendations, and NYSERDA's advanced energy efficiency proposals. Development of Chapter 1, which includes the scope, applicability, and administration enforcement requirements. Previously incorporated New York State amendments based on statutory requirements and policies and initiatives of the Code Council in the state, previously included in earlier versions of the Code. Review and recommendation based on 300 plus uniform code change proposals received by the Division since the adoption of the 2020 Codes. And last and not least, review and incorporation of 13 topics discussed and analyzed by the 2020 the 2021 Code Council work group. As Code Com Council members are already aware, but I'll mention here for the benefit of all parties, the code update process necessitates coordination with a number of state entities such as MTA, DEC, NYSERDA, DPS, Historic Preservation Office, and possibly more. At this time, division staff has successfully coordinated and developed proposed code change language to address the provisions for historic buildings with the Historic Preservation Office and included those into the already distributed draft documents. The division has also scheduled a meeting in October with staff from the DPS to discuss and coordinate on the provisions of energy law section 11104 e 
and Executive Law 37819F. Both of these sections require the language pertaining to the prohibition on fossil fuel equipment and building systems be coordinated with DPS to develop code language relating to an exemption for new building construction projects requiring an application for new or expanded electric service where electric service cannot be reasonably provided by the grid as determined by DPS. While the Code Council and Division relies on the ICC, ICC's heavily vetted and consensus-driven code development process for coordination amongst the books, including proper implementation of provisions and avoidance of conflicts for provisions, the code update development tasks and coordination work as outlined above, specific to New York State, we are able to rely on ICC for this part of the process. It requires a significant amount of coordination between the eight uniform code books and the energy code book, and hundreds of reference standards and thousands of pages of ICC code development documents, as well as longstanding legislation surrounding the energy code and uniform code. Division staff anticipates completing all of the important work and necessary coordinated effort in issuing a version 3.0 draft document by the first quarter of 2024. On that note, I'd like to speak generally about the timeline for this code update. And we have a representative from NYSERDA here today, Chris Corcoran, to speak about the timeline for the regulation establishing the life cycle cost analysis methodology and defining secondary or society benefits. This methodology in defining secondary or societal benefits is required by legislation to be adopted by NYSERDA in regulation prior to the Code Council adopting any updates to the Energy Code. The methodology in defining secondary and societal effects will be used to determine the cost effectiveness of any of the updates to the energy code. Once the regulation is adopted, it will take approximately one year for the codes to be effective. This includes the required SAPA process for public comment and hearing, which takes about three months. It also includes time to assess the public comments and modify accordingly. It also requires time to finalize the code books as well as a 90-day period of time by legislation for which the Uniform Code to become effective after filing and the necessary time for publication and finalizing of documents. This assumes there are no substantive changes needed to the codes following the public comment period. Uh, you know, any, any substantive changes would obviously result in additional time and public review and comment that's needed. So uh, at this time, I'll pass it off to Chris Corkin and he'll speak uh, directly to the life cycle cost analysis methodology and defining the secondary or society effects regulation and timeline. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Kevin and Code Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. My name is Chris Corcoran, and I lead the Code's Products and Standards team at NYSERDA. Uh, NYSERDA has been hard at work at preparing for a significant improvement in the way that New York State considers revisions to the Energy Code. As Kevin outlined, uh, members of, and as members of the Code Council know, Recent legislation requires NYSERDA to update the cost effectiveness, reg, re, cost effectiveness criteria for revisions to the Energy Code in support of the Climate Act. Considering the full life cycle costs of, of buildings in conjunction with societal effects is a critical step in making buildings cleaner and more resilient for all New Yorkers. This change will provide a more comprehensive view of the costs, benefits, and impacts of a proposed revision to Energy Code in New York. Additionally, this change al aligns with the goals of the Climate Act and is especially important for low-income New Yorkers who are disproportionately burdened by energy poverty and who will benefit from the state's historic transition to cleaner energy. In the coming months, you can expect several opportunities to provide comments and feedback that will uh, inform the development of cost-effectiveness regulation. NYSERDA will be hosting four public meetings across the state and virtually from October 17th to October 27th. Please visit NYSERDA's website next week uh, to get more information on how to participate in those meetings. In addition, NYSERDA will request the audience of the Code Council uh, for a more thorough briefing uh, of the update to the, code effective, to the cost effectiveness obligation um, at the quarterly meeting in December, after the review of the initial public comments and prior to the formal rulemaking kickoff. We are targeting a formal rulemaking kickoff in January of 2024. Uh, SAPA will provide an additional 60-day period of review and comment uh, from January until March. NYSERDA will sh continue to share information with this audience and the public more widely on how to provide comments uh, during this process. In the end, we are working towards a final rule that can be utilized by the Code Council by May 2024. 
NYSERDA NYSERDA is working diligently with its partners uh, to move this forward and deliver these important updates. So thank you for your time. Um, I'll hand it back to uh, Chair Tebow and, and Kevin. Thank you, Chris. So I'm just going to, before I open it up for any questions to either of the two gentlemen, uh, I'm just going to put some, some points on, on some things, right? We can't move forward with the code until they finish the cost methodology regulation. Uh, so there's a little bit of overlap that we can do, right? We can, we can start with the notice of rule and development while they're in their process. So we'll be looking to do that sometime in the spring after they put out their notice of proposed rulemaking. Following their adoption, which Chris just said is about May, then we would start our process. And that's that sort of year long process that Kevin just threw out there. SAPA obviously will take some time. We would probably look to be adopting now December 2020 or rather than September like we thought before. That's best read on the situation. As there's then a three month statutory holdback before those codes can go live. So we'd be looking at March 2025 before they would actually be live in jurisdictions. That could be delayed a little bit because publication takes time. Last time around, from adoption to, yes, was between five and six months. So just trying to give the code council the best read on the situation. Uh, I do want to point out one other thing, right? There is lots and lots of opportunities for public comment. Chris pointed out in his process during Zappa, obviously there's that 60 day comment period. If it's a revised rulemaking, there's another 45. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm remembering my rules. <laughs> uh, during our process, we welcome comments in writing or at these code council meetings right up through adoption. There's also going to be the notice of rule and development period, which I think will likely extend longer than 90 days if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly. So there'll be that opportunity for the public to comment on our uh, first draft, first real draft, first adoptable draft of a regulation. And then there'll be the SAPA period that we have to go through where the public will have the opportunity to comment there as well. As was pointed out, if there's a substantial change following that, there will be a revised period, revised rulemaking period, where we will also have an opportunity for public comment. So lots and lots of, of, of opportunities ahead for us uh, to hear from many, many, many interested parties. And I'm impressed as to how many interesting parties there are this time around. Uh, okay, that I think puts a point on where we are. So now I'll open it up. Do members have questions for Kevin or, or for Chris? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess my question is, well, well, to your point about that there are so many people commenting already, this is a critically important update. I mean, I think a lot of people didn't even know this council existed, but now they do because this is so important for the implementation of the targets and the CLCPA that are mandatory. It's not just, you know, something that we're trying to achieve. We, we need to achieve these goals, and it's so important that we implement these energy efficiency um, measures into the code as we are updating them now. Um, I know you said there's lots of opportunity for the public, and I mentioned this at the last meeting about trying to do some sort of workshop. Not everyone wants to dig into it on, on the code council, but there, you know, I would like to see what the changes are as they are getting developed in the draft, and I, I know that staff are working very, very hard on that, and it's gobs and gobs. I mean, you mentioned 300 different changes that are you know, that's just one tiny piece of it, um, and the hundreds and hundreds of pages. So I, and I'm not an engineer, so I don't know that I'd be able to provide a ton of feedback. But but even just like a high level summary of the changes would, in a public forum, so people could hear that as well. I think would be really beneficial. Okay, we can look at that. I think I, I agree with you. I think it's important to try and get easy information. As you, as you point out, many of us, I'm like you, are not an engineer or a, or a uh, architect, and, and so reading the code is, is sometimes a little difficult, especially when it's in a development phase and we're looking at red lines. So I agree right. with you. Right. It, Even the summary tables are a lot to look at. <laughs> so I think, yeah. 
even if it's just an educational piece for the code council so we understand what's happening, I think that would be great. Sure. Maybe we'll endeavor to, to start that at the December meeting and, and think a little bit. Okay. I have one more. Sure. Fire away. I know um, Kevin mentioned the All Electric uh, Building Act was in version 1.0. And you, you talked about the scoping plan. I think it was. I think you said that. I don't think it's it like is. Being it's, no. I think there's pieces of the various legislation that were included in 1.0 of the energy code documents. It's it's not all inclusive yet. Okay. And and we're you're shooting for 3.0 soon ish in the coming months and and including the New York specific legislative changes. I I wanted to know if that also includes the um, advanced building. Code, which kind of points towards the scoping plan recommendations, right? And you, which you mentioned. Yep. It's, okay. yeah, all of that stuff is what is anticipated to be included in the version 3.0. 3.0, okay. Looking at early 2024 to come to the Code Council. Correct. Yes. We have both electrification going on, and then we also have the advanced building code pieces coming out of stretch. 2023, Chris. <laughs> I'm just going to make an announcement. Uh, Council Member Sabatino has joined us. Thank you. We'll note he's here. He just waved. Hi, Michael. And then Mr. Corcoran said that they're going to do some sort of summary update to us at the December meeting right. about the um, nice sort of proposals. They're going to they're going to do cost methodology. Oh, that's right. Summary. Cost. Methodology. So they they're going to do. <laughs> By the end of, uh, of October, they will have done four, I believe, public meetings that are required by statute on their regulation. Then they're going to assess those, and then they're going to talk to us about it before they do the nice sort of board, board meeting that will approve the, that to move forward. That has to do with the life cycle. That, that has to do with life cycle. Not, okay. No, no. Advanced building code pieces, they have shared with us, there's how many? Emma would know that. Emma would know that better. <laughs> it's it's well in excess of 100. Uh, so we're working through those right now. Hopefully by the December meeting we'll be able to talk more intelligently about what what those are, what's included, what we're thinking about including, trying to get feedback from you on that. Or at a workshop, you know, like a week or two before <laughs> after that meeting. So I just shortened Kevin's timeline by probably a month. So <laughs> <laughs> she wants to take five weeks, right? I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not saying I need a final product. I'm saying let's let's. You know the hundred like let's talk about that what or be, be educated about what those things are fair enough okay thanks. fair enough anyone else mr kelly do we have any update from icc as to when they'll have a final set of the 2024 code documents kevin or john who's taking that one <laughs> john yeah john yeah we have we have gotten uh most of them i think we're missing missing the two um the residential code, and there's one other one that that we're fire fire code residential maybe another code one, but we're what's that? Uh, sorry, residential code, fire code, and energy code are the three we have yet to receive. Right, but the energy code we're still going to work off the 2021 to make it to 2024. So I I don't think there's a hold up on on us waiting for that. I think that was the original intent. So. Um, at this point, I'm, we're still in communications with ICC about getting the copies of those. Um, so hopefully, it'll be by by you know somewhat soon. So, so Ben, their website says it'll be posted mid November. Okay. On their website. Okay. Um, we have gotten the frame nature files a little earlier than that. Yeah. They're um, live with a couple of their code directs, correct? Right? They are correct. Live yeah, all, all but all yep. fire, residential, and obviously energy because it's the one we're not done yet. <laughs> so we're receiving them a little bit in advance so these guys can dig in, but it's... will they be on time? The 2024, do you think? For those? The spot there, January? That, that is a very hard question when you <laughs> when you dig into the energy. <laughs> okay. uh, there are a number of appeals, right, John? I mean, I, I know Emma's had a training this morning, so you kind of pinch hit a little bit here, but there's a number of appeals associated with the energy international energy code that have to play out we don't need that because we started from the 21 and built the 24 from scratch congratulations to emma that's pretty impressive and 
you know, we're, we're making some pretty major changes to it anyway. Um, so we don't necessarily need it. Really what we need is those last two fire codes, the residential code. Um, I'd like to say I'm very impressed. Uh, code enforcement official, it's a pleasure to see. We are much further ahead than what we were for New York State historically. And this is a significant amount of items that you guys have to deal with. Um, and that we obviously in the public can have one, but just so everyone knows for the record, I believe we are a lot further ahead than New York had been in the past. We were dragging behind, and it's been amazing to see you guys and all the information we get. Thanks, I appreciate that. I, I know the staff does, appreciates hearing that as well. I mean, it, it was funny when Claudia was speaking, I was thinking this, the words that she, she's not speaking here, this is a, almost a generational shift. It, I think this is probably the biggest jump that we've made since uh, we, we came and used the I codes starting in 03. Yes. I mean, I meant to say if you got it toward the tail end of 2025, that's still. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna no, be very good. <laughs> and, 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 and I just mean it in a sense that where I did for, as a code enforcement official, we prefer to be on that, and it's helpful because the commentary, the ICC, all of it together, it helps. But to see it that even if we're in that close to the ICC is really going to be an amazing task. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to try and be on the cycle with the ICC as close as we can be on the cycle with the ICC. And we're going to try and do that for the 2027 and the 2030. And I know I just sentenced uh, Kevin and his staff to <laughs> having a, maybe, maybe a few days off in between code <laughs> reviews. <laughs> but uh, instead of, of months that we used to have, but it, I agree with you, it's very important that we stay as close to them as we can say. Because there's a history of the codes that the ICC tends to lead on. And as an enforcement official, when you're that many code cycles behind, you're trying to understand <coughs> and explain it. The closer you can get, you can get everyone on the same page. Because a lot of architects and engineers have multiple states that they're licensing, and they do jump around. Appreciate that. Anyone else? OK. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kevin. All right, that moves us to the, the next agenda item, which is our public comment period. It is now 1038. We'll probably try and take a break around 1130 if, if we're still going. I'm going to announce for the record that we are going to limit again, like we did last time, to three minutes per speaker. Uh, I, I believe that you can get your, your point across in that three minute period. Uh, when the clock, which is now the clock, when the clock goes off, uh, I'll ask you to finish up and, and 20 seconds later I'm going to have to cut you off uh, so that we can reach everybody because I think we have 18 now? Yeah. Okay, we're up to 18. Uh, but we, obviously we really want to hear what you have to say. If you, uh, if you feel the need to, to say more than what you, if you can in three minutes, please send the uh, comments to us. We send them to, uh, to Kevin Dewar Clark and we, he will get them out to the members. We routinely do that. Okay. Uh, Kevin, turning it over to you, although I guess I don't know. Okay. So I think uh, at this time, I think we have one person here in Albany looking to make public comment, and then one person in New York City looking to make public comment. So we'll start here with Ken Pokalski. Good morning, Ken. Right, well, good morning. My name is Ken Pokalski. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Business Council of New York State, based here in Albany. We're a statewide employer association representing about 2,300 private sector companies and other business associations across the state and in all sectors. Um, as you might expect, there's a broad interest in the business community on the development of new e-building uh, regulations, uh, including from business groups who participated in the legislative development and are interested in assuring that the inclusion negotiated limitations and exemptions in any final rule. Uh, we had submitted uh, a, a letter signed by 24 uh, business groups, including our own, to the council. Uh, hopefully that's being circulated. Uh, we recognize that uh, uh, producing significant emission reductions from the building sector is an essential part of the CLCPA uh, implementation. But it's important in, in this rulemaking and others that we're involved with, from the cap and trade program, uh, to other uh, other actions moving forward, uh, that these regulations provide workable, affordable compliance provisions that avoid significant economic and emissions leakage out of state, uh, and eventuality that would uh, have adverse impacts on both global emissions and in-state businesses, employees, and residents alike. 
Uh, in our memo, we highlight some of the key provisions of the, of the statute that we, we think are essential uh, that need to be fleshed out in, in, uh, in a sensible, workable way in any final regulations, including uh, the, you know, how, what I'll call the, the installation deadline is going to work, particularly for uh, projects uh, already uh, approved and underway. Uh, key definitions regarding how the uh, both the the, stand, the, the the required and allowable exemptions uh, will be applied to uh, manufacturing facilities. Uh, what it means to be electrification ready, where where sites are exempted, uh, and also we, we we emphasize that you know earlier earlier changes uh, to the energy law adopted twenty twenty two directed the co council to ensure that the code remains cost effective, including consideration of life cycle costs. I know we've already talked about in the meeting today. These are, you know, we're working on a number of major implementation rules uh, related to CLCPA. Uh, done well, we think they'll provide a, a workable path forward to meeting these very aggressive emission reduction and renewable energy standards. Uh, done poorly, uh, we think there's going to be significant unintended adverse uh, consequence. As a final comment, we look forward to working with, with uh, the co-counsel and the agencies doing this, and it's, it's encouraging to hear today uh, that we heard today how much outreach you're going to be doing. We think uh, this body and other CLCPA implementation bodies should be reaching out to all stakeholders early and often. We think what the, what DEC and their survey has done so far on cap and invest is a great a great example. These are complex, wide wide ranging rulemakings. I think the more the more public input, the better. So appreciate the time today. Thanks, Ken. And I'll note for the council members that we received a, a two-page memo from Ken this morning. Uh, did it about 8.30, so we're going to get that to the members when these guys are done doing what they're doing right now. All right. Uh, Kevin, who's next? All right. So then in New York City, we have Cliff Fonstein. Yes, uh, my name is Cliff Fonstein. Uh, I'm a member of RAP New York. It's a faith-based organization engaged in social justice advocacy. We are the social arm, a social justice arm of Reform Judaism in New York State with 99 synagogues and 150,000 congregants across the state. We submitted a written statement in June, and I spoke to you folks in, in June as well. As part of our multi-year climate initiative, our congregants have worked hard during the past two years to advocate for the passage of the All Electric Building Act, calling, emailing, and meeting with our legislators across the state. And now the ball is in your court to do what the act has you to do. Um, since June, when we spoke, we've been faced with uh, smoky skies because of the fires in Canada caused by climate change. We've had the hottest July in record, <coughs> the hottest August in record, and what looks like will be the hottest September in record. We fought hard for the passage of the All Electric Building Act because our tradition teaches us that we have a responsibility to look after the earth and to preserve the planet for future generations. As is said in a powerful midrash, do not destroy my world, for if you do, there will be nobody after you to make it right again. It is important that you follow the instructions of the New York State Legislature scrupulously. The current building code was written with three important climate before three important climate laws were enacted: the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the Advanced Building Codes Act, and the All Electric Building Act. The, the 2024 update must incorporate these thought, three laws in a way that embodies their precise meaning and intent. The All Electric Building Act, for example, requires that the building code shall, and it uses the word shall prohibit all equipment and building systems that burn fossil fuels in newly constructed buildings after certain dates. Any exemption must be limited to the specific area or system within the building and only where it is infeasible to enforce the fossil fuel ban. And feasibility is specifically defined in the statute. It excludes financial considerations. You only look to see if electrification, electrification is physically and technically feasible. Where there is an exemption, those areas must be electrification ready as defined by the legislature. Finally, in updating the building code, you must keep in mind the overarching direction the legislature has given to you. And I'm quoting now, 
to the fullest extent possible the code shell, they use shell again, be designed to help achieve the state's clean energy and climate agenda. And the code shall enable the state's clean energy objectives. In sum, we ask the council to scrupulously implement the wording and intent of the climate legislation so that the building code shall fully enable the state's clean energy objectives. We will watch closely and fully support you in that endeavor. Thank you so much. Kevin. Okay, and then before we go to the remote speakers, I just will note that we did have two people write in a comment to the chat. Robert, or Richard Roberts indicated that at the ICC Fire Code Action Committee uh, last week, it was announced by ICC staff that the 24 IFC will be published sometime in 2023. Um, and Thomas McKinney uh, just noted uh, that the other 2024 books could be potentially adopted without waiting for the energy code based on the need for everything to be in the energy code that we're waiting on. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. We're into WebEx now? Yep, so then we're going to move to WebEx. Just give me just a minute here. <clears throat> so Robert Kaponis is next. Give us one second to unmute. Okay. Jack, are you, are you able to mute and unmute? Hello? You're on, Robert. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Kapanos. I'm the executive director for the New York Housing Association. We're a trade association compromised of manufactured housing retailers, brokers, uh, manufactured home community owners and developers, manufactured housing manufacturers, and uh, suppliers and, and various ancillary service companies. Uh, our industry is committed to the quality of growth of the manufactured housing industry in New York State. The association is dedicated to encouraging and promoting affordable housing choices for the state of New York and to promote the highest standards of business ethics and practices within the manufactured housing industry. It has come to our attention that the implementation of fire sprinklers is being considered for single family construction in the state. NYHA poses mandatory fire sprinklers in HUD code manufactured homes and res re respectfully requests an exemption from the proposed requirement. Requiring fire sprinklers in HUD code manufactured homes would have an impact on their affordability. Uh, things, various things like an initial cost increase, installing fire sprinklers uh, uh, in manufactured homes would add to the initial construction cost. This added expense uh, could lead to higher prices for manufactured homes, making them less affordable for potential buyers. Uh, manufacturers and builders of HUD code manufactured homes would need to invest in new materials, equipment, and labor to install fire sprinkler systems. These additional costs most likely would be passed on to the consumers <coughs> in terms of higher home prices. Uh, insurance savings, I, you know, just a, a kind of a laundry list of, of things that, that I was thinking of, but. That, you know, obviously there would be a, a benefit for, from an insurance standpoint, but would that cost offset the installation cost over time? It, it may, I mean, it may not never fully negate the affordability concerns. And, and really importantly, low income buyers are our are, are primary market and affordability is, is their primary concern. Um, acquiring fire sprinklers could pose, pose a challenge for this demographic, especially if it substantially increases the cost of entry level homes. Again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak this morning, and you know, we respectfully request that we are exempted from the uh, the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Next, we have Steve McDaniel. Hold on, Steve. Let me unmute you. Steve, you should be live. Okay, can you hear me? We can, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I uh, wasn't sure uh, whether or not I wanted to speak today um, because the notice was sent out and there was no agenda. There was nothing for us to review. There were several comments that have been made about 
plenty of opportunities to be heard or for the public to be heard. I sure hope that in the future, it's not like it was set up for today. The agenda wasn't released until 24 hours prior to this meeting. And we're going to have public drafts of hundreds and hundreds of pages of code with giving the public only 24 hours to review, I believe is fair. So I would hope that the agendas would be released uh, sooner than 24 hours prior to the meeting. That's all I really have to say today. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Chad. Uh, Maurice Constantino. Hold on one second while I find you. Not seeing them actually on here. Chad, why don't we jump to the next one then? We'll come so back. That'll be John Steele. John, you should reply. You hear me? We can yeah. hear you now, John. Okay, thank you. And good morning, members of the council and staff. Thank you for your time. My name is John Steele, and I work for Johnson Controls, a global building technology company with 1,200 employees and 18 facilities in the state of New York. I am before you to ask for your support to improve indoor air quality for building occupants across the state. Specifically, I ask that Appendix D and E in the 2024 International Mechanical Code be adopted as part of the state code. Both were adopted into the IMC appendix with 95% of the vote. Appendix D requires that HVAC system design airflow accommodate a MERV 13 filter when greater air filtration is required. Shifting an air filtration system to a MERV 13 when needed is critical to occupant health because a MERV 13 removes smaller, finer particles, including dust, pollen, mold, bacteria, COVID, RSV and wildfire particles, which standard building air filters cannot. Appendix E requires that CO2 sensors be installed every 500 square feet of occupiable space. The sensors will trigger the introduction of fresh air into a space when the amount of CO2 reaches an unsafe level. High levels of CO2 indicate unhealthy indoor air and could lead to person-to-person -person spread of a contagion or other airborne health threats. Both proposals are impactful yet inexpensive ways to provide building occupants with cleaner indoor air. Having an air handling unit MERV 13 filter ready is typically less than $1 per square foot and installing a CO2 sensor is typically less than 50 cents a square foot. The proposals are endorsed by many New York and national public health organizations, nonprofits, and others, including the American Lung Association, New York chapter, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the American Institute of Architects New York Chapter, the International Well Building Institute, and United Spinal. Their letter of support for adoption of these proposals is in your meeting materials. In closing, a few facts. Up to 90% of our lives are spent indoors. Source, Harvard School of Public Health. On average, you will take 2 million breaths a year in your office or other indoor spaces. Again, Harvard School of Public Health. And on a given day, you will breathe in 2,000 gallons of air. Source, American Lung Association. <coughs> Given the importance of clean indoor air to the health of building occupants across the state of New York, I respectfully ask that the council adopt Appendix D and E as part of the code. By doing so, New York will demonstrate leadership on improving indoor air quality, leadership that prioritizes occupant health, well-being, and productivity while fortifying buildings against future health threats. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Next up, we have Aaron Sherman. Uh, my name is Aaron Sherman. I belong to RMI, an independent nonprofit founded in 1982. 
that transforms global energy systems through market-driven solutions to secure a clean, prosperous, zero-carbon future for all. I'm joining today with others to once again implore the Building Code Council to execute the mandates of the All Electric Buildings Act and the Advanced Codes and Standards Act. I'm encouraged that more information was shared this meeting about necessary steps in this direction, including NYSERDA rulemaking to define life cycle costs. And I note with concern that to date, the council appears not to have considered code language that fulfills AEBA mandates and that the new timeline information today appears to lengthen the timeline for the energy code, at least from previous understandings. I hope that this timeline will hereafter remain stable and not continue to lengthen in future communications from the division and other stakeholders. We urge the council to adopt all electric and high energy efficiency new construction requirements first on time and in alignment with the update to New York versions of the 2024 I codes. Second, in compliance with an updated definition of cost effectiveness for the energy code that accounts for secondary and societal effects, such as greenhouse gas emissions. Third, with minimal exceptions or loopholes permitting fossil fuel use only for the limited purposes that are truly infeasible to accomplish with electricity, and finally, requiring forward-looking electrification readiness measures in buildings that obtain exceptions for limited fossil fuel use. Requiring all electric, highly efficient new construction will protect occupants' health and the global climate that all of us depend on. On health, all electric new buildings will eliminate combustion inside homes and workplaces, which creates health harming pollutants like nitrogen oxides and PM 2.5. The New York chapters of both the American Lung Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics endorsed the All Electric Buildings Act, citing peer reviewed research that these pollutants disproportionately harm the health of children, those with chronic respiratory conditions, older adults, and people of color. Finally, there is a cost to delay. Tens of thousands of new fossil fuel heated homes will be permitted in parts of New York that have not independently committed to all electric new construction between now and the end of 2025. All of those homes will have to be electrified at higher cost down the road to meet the broader goals of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Fortunately, all electric new buildings will not only eliminate emissions within their own walls, they'll also shift the broader construction and HVAC markets to better meet the pressing need to decarbonize our existing homes and workplaces. This is an urgently needed step in the right direction. RMI looks forward to the prompt and comprehensive implementation of these mandates by this body and stands ready to assist. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Michael Hernandez. Hello, Building Code Council, uh, Department of State, and NYSERDA staff. Um, thank you for your hard work and dedicated public service. Uh, my name is Michael Hernandez. I'm New York Policy Director for Rewiring America. Rewiring America is a national nonprofit focused on helping people move forward with their electrification and energy efficiency projects in their homes and communities. Uh, we are eagerly looking forward to reviewing the updated energy code versions two and three uh, that were spoken about today at the meeting. Uh, we also um, just wanted to point out to, uh, that the climate law required that the Department of State, NYSERDA, and the Building Code Council prioritize the decarbonization of disadvantaged communities in their administrative decisions, uh, just like um, the 2024 building code update. Uh, in fact, the, the, not only did it say you had uh, to prioritize the decarbonization of disadvantaged communities, it, there's a prohibition against doing it as well. In order to achieve this prioritization, the climate law uh, required NYSERDA, DEC, and NIPA to create um, the disadvantaged communities report to identify what are the opportunities and barriers to decarbonizing um, disadvantaged communities. That report was published in December of 2024. It specifically highlights uh, building codes as a barrier and an opportunity for the decarbonization of disadvantaged communities. That report was incorporated into the Climate Action Council scoping plan that was adopted in December of 2022. 
The Advanced Building Codes and Standards Act passed in, in 2022 also requires the Building Code Council to incorporate the recommendations of the Climate Action Council into the 2024 Building Code. So members, Building Code Council members, we just ask that you, you please ask the Department of State and ICERTA staff to identify what are the recommendations of the Disadvantaged Communities Report and the recommendations of the Climate Action Council that are related to the building codes and how they have incorporated those recommendations into the 2024 building code draft before you vote to approve it. Uh, and I'll just note simply electrifying new construction as required by the All Electric Building Act will not satisfy all the recommendations of the Climate Action Council scoping plan or the disadvantaged communities report. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. And next up we have Michael Fazio. Good morning, Code Council. Uh, my name is Mike Fazio. I am the executive director of the New York State Builders Association. We represent uh, home builders, contractors, construction professionals, architects, and engineers all across New York State. And um, heading into next year, um, the Code Council definitely has, has their hands full and uh, you have a heavy task, heavy lifts going forward to implement new building code, energy code changes, all electrification as we head towards the, uh, the deadline for new construction at the end of uh, 2025. And I would just ask the code council to be mindful of the severe housing shortage we have in New York State, uh, to be mindful about the lack of availability and affordability uh, and of attainable housing for middle class people across the state, and to understand the effects the decisions you'll be making have, which may lead to additional costs to new construction and how it's going to affect all new construction, but really it's going to affect folks who have been traditionally left out of attaining a home ownership and left out of the, over the years of being able to uh, start the process to obtain generational wealth, whether they're buying a new home, a co-op, a condo, whatever it may be. And listening today, you know, we, we, we go, we're heading towards electrification, uh, changing the building code, changing the energy code, possibly looking at mandatory fire sprinklers. And we just heard a gentleman talk about uh, indoor air quality. I think it's important to understand that when people segregate these items and take them and say it's only a dollar a square foot or it's only $35 additional square foot or only three, these are all straws that are on the camel's back. How much can people take to buy a new home in new, around New York City or even around Westchester or, or, or suburbs all over the, all over the state? Homes are, are unattainable um, and we are headed in the direction of losing people, good people who, who are, will be leaving the state to, uh, to our neighbor uh, states as our housing issues continue and houses are just become unattainable. Thank you for, for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Up next, we have Ann Kernick. Kernick, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. I'm with Safe Cities at Stand Out Earth. We work with advocates and government leaders around the U.S. and Canada on policies that phase out fossil fuels, including building electrification. Workers recognize as a leader for both the growing number of local and now statewide policies on building electrification. Now we have to make them real and you have a, a big responsibility on that. I appreciate the steps that have been laid out today um, on the code update and I want to urge on the speedy and on time action on updating the building code to incorporate the provisions of the all electric building act and the recommendations of the Climate Action Council on both new and existing buildings. And I wanna echo the request for uh, updates for the public 
um, uh, intermittently, um, not just um, when the entire code um, updates are ready so that people have time uh, to assess the progress and weigh in uh, with suggestions. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Next up is Bill Nowak. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great, great. Well, thank you uh, for this opportunity and thank you for the incredibly important work you're doing in setting the code that will guide the transition to decarbonized buildings. I had a chance to speak at your June meeting and at that point, I, my main focus was to urge you to set up the, the most, the strongest uh, set of codes for building electrification and decarbonization as, as you could. At that point, I'm sure I mentioned the 47 brothers and sisters in Buffalo who died during the incredible Christmas uh, storm that we had here. It was just unprecedented and unworldly. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the whole uh, rationale for the importance of decarbonizing, but I did want to mention more recent um, phenomena, one of which was the poisoned air that we all experienced this summer from the Canadian wildfires, uh, you know, a completely unacceptable situation. Uh, I had the, the privilege to march with 75,000 people uh, last weekend to uh, call for an end to fossil fuel use as part of the transition to get us away from climate change. And I think another thing that happened recently that I wanted to point out was the UN Secretary General um, and saying, and I quote, humanity has opened the gates of hell. And that's uh, certainly what it feels like at this point, given the number of different calamities that have been happening around around the world. Uh, but, you know, for this meeting, I wanted to ask a question and, and make a comment. The, the one comment is that uh, I certainly agree with the, uh, the woman for, who is at your board, I'm sorry I didn't get her name, who called for a high level view of the changes in a public forum as, as soon as possible. Uh, I think people are feeling at this point a bit in the dark as to where the Coast Council is on, on this transition, and, and it's going to be important for um, all the different communities of New York State to hear where things are at as it develops. And in that in that uh, connection, I've been looking for any publicly available doc document that integrates some of the Advanced Building Code or the All Electric Building Act and was under the impression that there hasn't been anything produced. I heard something mentioned today about a, a level one document. If it's possible to put in the chat where uh, any documents that have pr been prepared so far or, re or uh, distributed and reviewed, that would be helpful. And I'd like to urge you on your website, which to my mind is fairly opaque at this point, to kind of put up a, a spot where people are going to be able to see the changes and the documents as they're released with, without having to dig too hard. And with that, once again, I thank you for your work and, and wish you um, strength and, and wisdom in moving forward. Thank you, sir. So I do not see uh, Michael Waite, so we'll move on to Deb Peck Kelleher. Hold on, Deb. Deb, you should be unmuted. Um, my name is Deb Kelleher. I'm the Deputy Director of the Alliance for Clean Energy New York. We are a member-driven association with a mission to promote the use of clean, renewable electricity technologies and energy efficiency in New York in order to increase energy diversity and security, boost economic development, improve public health, and reduce air pollution. We supported the we support the updated building codes that expedites electrification, and we worked on the passage of the advanced building codes and appliance and efficiency act of 2022 last year. Um, the law requires the energy code to be revised to achieve the state's clean energy and climate agenda and to implement the climate action plans recommendations, which was finalized last December. 
These recommendations include highly insulated thermal performance, air tightness, electric readiness, require energy storage, require on-site renewable generation, require grid interactive electric appliances, and the elimination of barriers to residential adoption of ground source heat pumps. Um, we want to thank the council for all their work so far in incorporating the advanced building codes law into the draft energy code. Um, but would also remind you that these need to include the recommendations of the climate action plan. Um, and the All Electric Buildings Act, which was signed into law this year, which makes your life a little bit, <laughs> but adds that time crunch to the issuance of the code. Um, we urge the council, the department, and my service staff to ensure a timely implementation of this updated code by the end of 2025. Um, we'd like to thank the council for stating that they're going to comply with both of these laws in the code. Um, and thank you for your time and all your efforts so far on this. Thank you. I'm going to apologize right now. Message his name, Kara Leas Epigilla. Hello. Yep. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is uh, Kara Lee Battaglia. I am the CEO of the Building Performance Contractors Association of New York State, a not for profit trade association representing hundreds of energy certified businesses and community organizations in every county of New York State, the five boroughs of New York City and Long Island. Our members specialize in working with the low to moderate income population. We thank you for continuing to modify to meet climate goals on electrification laws and goals in New York, but it must be done sooner rather than later. And it must be practice based in line with building science filling the gaps between policy and practice that exist in this industry. Bring building code up to meet energy mandates in the most practical of ways, or you will inadvertently negatively affect multiple industries, thousands of businesses, and millions of New York State taxpayers, building owners, and users over the next 30 years. Building code revisions must proactively and immediately support electrification of new construction, address climate recommendations, reduce unintentional but disproportionate impacts that cause energy poverty and energy equity issues, and bridge the gap between policy, politics, and practice that causes fiscal impacts to taxpayers and contractors. 2024 codes are critical to best practices, quality controls, and cost controls. As more people are trying to install heat pumps, insulation, and other measures, we're seeing increasingly ineffective or poor quality installs that do not meet energy efficiency standards. There is a difference between the training and knowledge of a general contractor and an energy certified contractor that the public does not distinguish. Strict requirements must be met to ensure that they actually make buildings energy efficient. Right now, many do not. Building code re revision must include building performance efficiency in practice and not just policy. Energy requirements and building codes for new buildings are the single most important measures for that efficiency. Codes also serve as the efficiency target for improvements of existing buildings. So the 2024 energy requirements for new building codes will either lower or increase consumer retrofit costs for the next 30 years. If not included completely, there will be lost opportunities in new construction phases that will lead to wildly inflated costs for homeowners in the future. Energy efficient codes to the current high standards are needed to protect New York State taxpayers, cost, comfort, health, and safety. Building codes are necessary to protect building owners and users from energy poverty or installation abuses. I continue to call on this council to set, enforce, and regularly update building performance science, best practice, and quality control requirements for energy efficiency in new buildings within the 2024 building code. This is an economic mandate to protect New York State taxpayers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I do not see the next several people on the list, including Jody Smith Anderson and Alicia Bacon. We'll move to Helen Brown. Give me one second.
And I'm not seeing Helen Brown either. So that brings us to Anshel Gupta. And Anshel, you are live. Good morning. Are you able to hear me? We are. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Anshul Gupta, and I'm the Senior Policy Analyst at New Yorkers for Clean Power and a member of the leadership team of the Climate Reality Project's New York State Coalition. Uh, as we know, the 2023 budget legislation prohibits the use of fossil fuels in most buildings up to seven floors by the end of 2025 and clarifies that financial considerations shall not be sufficient basis to determine physical or technical infeasibility. Uh, in addition to specific prescriptions, the Advanced Building Codes, Appliance and Equipment Efficiency Standards Act of 2022 mandates that to the fullest extent feasible, the standards for construction of buildings in the code shall be designed to help achieve the state's clean energy and climate agenda as identified by the Climate Action Council. The Climate Action Council's recommendations are detailed in Chapter 12 of the Scoping Plan and must be incorporated in the 2024 Energy Code update. New York's most recent budget included an economy-wide cap and invest program, uh, Governor Hochul's preferred vehicle for funding the implementation of the state's climate act. Under this market-based approach, the state's climate pollution would be capped at progressively decreasing limits each, each year in accordance with the targets of the climate act. Section eight of the CLCPA directs all state agencies, including the Department of State to promulgate regulations to contribute to achieving the statewide greenhouse gas emissions limits established in Article 75 of the Environmental Conservation Law. It also behooves the Department of State and other state agencies to work cohesively in support of the Governor's Cap and Invest Program, as well as the core principles that Governor Hochul has laid out for its program, for this program. Affordability is the first among these core principles. The least cost emissions reductions are those that can be achieved through regulations rather than having to be priced, priced out of the market. A building code that fully implements the Advanced Codes and Standards Law of 2022 and the All Electric Building Act of 2023 will contribute to the success of the Capital Invest Program and will also contribute to its affordability. In contrast, building codes that result in higher levels of greenhouse gas emissions from new construction would be a long-term <clears throat> brag on Governor Hochul's signature cap and invest program due to the longevity of the buildings and the cumulative impacts of ine inefficient construction. For this industry, unfortunately, and its allies have often raised unfounded concerns around the cost and reliability of all electric and efficient buildings, the capacity of the electric grid by mischaracterizing NISO's reliability concerns around the summer peak electricity demand in downstate New York, and the speed and time frames of the energy transition. Many municipalities in New York State, including New York City, Ithaca, and the city of Beacon, are moving ahead with modern building electrification codes at a much faster timeline than the state because of not just the climate and health benefits, but also reduced costs due to a single energy system and lower overall energy consumption. Sir, I'm uh, gonna have to ask you to wrap it up, please. Yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. That's it. Uh, it's anybody that we skipped because they weren't there? Should... I have not seen them come back. I've not seen them return. Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to address the council today? Okay, and I'll close public comment for this meeting. And we'll move to agenda item seven, future meetings. Uh, our next meeting is December 1st this year. I'm hoping that uh, our friends in Buffalo will not have a ton of snow and we won't, we won't have any issues. Yeah, I know, not going. Uh, for 2024, we sent out prospective dates. Those dates are sort of tight and that we're trying to, to hit certain points on the on the rule adoption calendar. So we're looking at March 22, June 28, September 27, and December 6. Uh, those are tentative dates for now until we hear from all of the members. Uh, also, they are subject to moving as well, depending on where we are in our code adoption uh, timeline next year. 
Okay, that leads us to other business. Last agenda item. Does anyone have any other business to bring before the council today? Hearing none. Okay, I'll do my normal. I'm going to thank uh, council members, first of all, because I know this is a lot. Um, uh, you're hearing from a lot of people and, and you're seeing a lot of material and, and it's, a, it's a difficult road. We're going to get there. Uh, I want to thank the staff. Uh, I know, you know, sometimes it doesn't look like uh, it's, 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 it's bearing them, but it is. And I, I see it every day. These guys are working incredibly hard and there's more of them than, I, than I've seen before. So, and the staffs keep growing to, to meet the need here. So, uh, and I want to thank council for joining us today both. I uh, appreciate you guys. Okay. With that, uh, and nothing else, I will call the meeting to an end and we will adjourn uh, until December 1st. Thank you so much. We are off the record.